So turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the longest treat treatment of the resurrection anywhere in Scripture. And it comes, Paul, throughout the book of Corinthians, you remember our, our study through that book, that he was dealing with a carnal church. Yes, a church. Yes, there were born-again believers in it. And in this passage, he's going to raise a question. says, you know, if, if indeed you haven't believed in vain. Because he's going to discuss the absolute importance of the resurrection. Now, the, the title of the message, if we want to follow the theme of our doors of the Bible, I'd like to use that working title of the door of the empty tomb. Now, we're not going to focus on the gospel accounts of that Passion Week, the Passover, the burial, the resurrection in that sense. We're going to look at the importance of the resurrection itself as it relates to the believer, to his salvation, to his faith, and to his eternity. Why can we not negotiate on the resurrection? And that is where we want to focus. Well, here in chapter 15, it, it comes after a series, you'll recall it, beginning in chapter 1 of this book. And chapter after chapter after chapter, Paul is dealing with one problem after another in this church. And some of them are, just, I'm talking, just gross things that they had allowed to come into the church and sins that even among the world were not acceptable. And here they were tolerating it inside the church of Jesus Christ. But it culminates with the treatment of a problem that was in the church itself. And it, it's listed here in verse 12. He doesn't even get to the problem itself until verse 12. And it says this, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Can you imagine a member of a church that had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and a church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ that stands up and says there is no resurrection of the dead? Well, folks, there are religions, as I put in my email this morning or last night, uh, there are religions that deny the death of Christ. He didn't really die. He just slept or this. And then they deny, other groups will deny the very resurrection. In fact, many Christian denominations that have gone liberal in their theology, they are beginning to question the miracles and even, yes, the resurrection, the virgin birth of Christ, the essential truths of the word of God that without those being true, our salvation is null and void. And that is Paul's concern in this chapter as he goes through it. So we're going to, we're not going to get through it all this morning and probably not even in both services. My goal is to finish it up next week on Easter Sunday itself. But let's, let's read verses 1 and 2. He's going to divide this into several parts. This first part, he's just going to remind them of how important the resurrection is to the gospel. It's a reminder of the importance of the resurrection. That's in verses 1 to 11. As we look at that empty tomb, what is it a picture of? The cross? We know the cross. It is a symbol of what? The death of Jesus Christ. The shedding of his blood on that cross as our substitute, as a payment for our sins. So when you see a cross, not a crucifix with Christ on the cross, because he didn't remain on that cross. That is a picture of death. He did die. He was buried. But the, then you have the picture of the empty tomb. What's the picture of the empty tomb a symbol of? The resurrection, that open door that had been sealed shut with the authority of the king and no one dared open that door. Well, that door, it opened of its own accord. Another automatic door in the Bible, isn't it? We saw that one with Peter last week. And he came forth. And that is, that is the central core part of our faith. And so when we look at those symbols, those are two symbols that as you see them, there are things you need to be reminded of. And Paul is going to do that in verses 1 through 11. He's just going to remind them, what did we preach to you? Look at verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now remember, he's been chiding these people, especially those, not the entire church, but those in the church that are stirring up this trouble. There were some, if you look back in chapter 14 and verse 35, it says, I'm sorry, verse 36. Paul, he gets very sarcastic, so to speak. It says, what, came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Did God's word, did you produce God's word? You seem to know so much, and that goes back to some previous chapters. He said, or did God's word come to you alone and nobody else has received it? Verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and, to, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. He's dealing with a, a terrible situation. But he had to challenge those, and he, you're going to see him allude to those things here. But what he's saying here in verse 1 is, Brethren, I'm having to declare to you again the same gospel that I preached. Now the words, I, I don't normally like to go into the grammar of the Greek, but it, is, it helps paint a vivid, more vivid picture. The word preached and received, these are what they call aorist tense. That means it's an event, it's a fact that occurred at a certain point in history. This occurred, he said, I preached this gospel to you. I'm declaring to you again what I preached back then. And number two, I am preaching to you that which you received. And that is also the same tense. You received it then. Completed action is a fact that occurred in the past. So I preached that which you also received. This was when we first came. Now I'm having to declare it again. That's kind of a, a little reproach or rebuke, isn't it? Why am I having to come back? He already told them I'm having to treat you as babes in Christ and not as mature. I have to feed you with milk and not with meat. Why? You've not grown in the Lord. You're still a carnal and a worldly Christian. So he said, I preached, you have received, and look at this, wherein ye stand. That's a different tense. That's what we call perfect tense. Wherein ye stand means it's an action that was completed in the past. You took your stand upon the gospel. We preached, you received it, you took a stand, but the results of that stand are continuing even through today. That's true of you and me when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. It occurs at that moment we place our trust in Him. You are saved and you are saved forever. I love the book of John when you go through and you read and when you look at the original language, the tenses of those verbs, it means this happened and the results abide from here on. And, and folks, that is powerful. You can't lose your salvation. You're not trying to work your way into salvation. The moment you believe, you have everlasting life. You shall not, future tense, come into condemnation, but you have past tense. From the moment you believe, with abiding results, you pass from death to life. Now that sounds sort of technical, but... Understand, this is what Paul is saying. I preached it, you received it, you've taken your stand, and wherein you are standing today if you're a part of this church. Because you have continued here, that's what the church preaches. The church is the body of Christ. Verse 2, by which also ye are being saved. You say the word being isn't in there. No, not in the English, but the tense of the verb, it's continuous action. So wait a second, you just said that I'm saved at the moment of salvation. Now, why does Paul here say, by that same gospel, you are being saved? Well, remember, at the moment of salvation, we are saved from the what? The penalty of sin. We will not come into condemnation. We have passed from death to life. Secondly, we have been saved from the power of sin. It will no longer have dominion over us. But what have we not been saved from yet? The presence of sin. And as we grow in Christ, the old nature, the temptations of the world around us, the opposition of the enemy, of the believer, 
they become less and less of an issue as we grow in grace and knowledge and become more and more like Christ. But when will we ultimately be saved from the presence of sin? At the rapture. At that point, we will be saved from even the presence of sin. So that's what he's not saying that you're not saved at the moment you trust Christ, because the scriptures are too clear elsewhere. But Paul does, in fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians, deal with that progressive sanctification of the believer. Now, he says, ye are being saved, if ye keep in memory that I preached what I preached unto you, that gospel, the one I received and that I preached unto you, and he's going to focus on that in a moment. He said, that is the gospel that is the basis of your salvation. And if you abandon that gospel, which includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you, you're, you're taking the power of the gospel out of, out of it. It has no power left. It can't save you. It can't give you hope. It can't do anything. So be careful when you say there's no resurrection of the dead. And he finishes with that. I'm not going to say it's a veiled threat. I'm not going to say, but it's, it's a powerful message. It says, if it is, that you're even saved. Because if there's no resurrection, you certainly believed in vain. But if there is resurrection and you don't believe in it, then you're denying the very power of the gospel that is to save you. So he's saying, have you believed in vain? Is it null and void? Is it useless? Well, look at verse 3 and 4. He's going to give two essential parts of the gospel. And it presumes the other parts. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas. And then it goes on with a list of witnesses, which we'll get to in a moment. Now think about this for a moment. And in this, this verse, you can find the four key statements that he's going to make. By the, the word, it begins with the word that. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen. Each of those critical phrases starts with that word that. So what, what do they mean? Paul says, I deliver to you first of all. Now, first of all is speaking of a matter of importance. First of all, this is of prime or, or top importance of what I shared to you. I gave you what? Which, that which also I received. Now, this speaks of the continuity of the gospel from what Christ told his disciples before he died about his death, burial, and resurrection. And then what the, the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost and since then, and then it comes down to him. He also received it, and that's what he gave to them. So it goes back to that illusion. Did, did the word of God come from you, Corinthians? No, it didn't. It's a rhetorical question. Or did it come only to you? No, it didn't. So how did you get the gospel? It said, I preached it to you. And what did I preach to you? It didn't come from me either. So those who are questioning my authority and my apostleship there in the church at Corinth, you can just... Set that aside. I received that gospel and I passed it on to you. And folks, that is a summary of what your life and my life as in Christ is to consist of. How do I witness to someone? How do I tell my neighbor, my friend, my family about the Lord? I, I didn't go to Bible college. I don't have a gift to speak in public, that sort of thing. How do I do this? It's this simple. You give them what you received. Tell them what God did for you. Tell them why you placed your trust in Christ. And that is the very foundation. Now, as we grow and we know more, we have more we can share. But start with what you know now and do that step by step. Well, that's the continuity. Now, what was the gospel? Two essential parts is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, when he says according to the scriptures, what is he talking about? Well, Remember, the, the New Testament has not yet been written. So the, when he says according to the scriptures, he's referring to Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament uh, canon of scripture. 
So the Old Testament predicts, it prophesies the death, and burial, and resurrection of Christ. So when it says he died according to the scriptures, he fulfilled what God said would occur, and it was according to the scriptures. All those prophetic pictures and types and prophecies themselves were fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So he died. Now we say, why is it important that Christ died? And we'll get, this will be dealt with in another section that deals a little more focused on the theological part of the, the argument. But let me just mention it here. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, what does it say, the first part of the verse? The wages of sin is what? Death. Physical death first, but apart from the intervention of God, it also speaks of the second death, which is eternity and the lake of fire apart from God. So when Christ died... He came to be the substitute for mankind. Why did he have to be a substitute for mankind? Well, Romans 3.23 tells us that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. What is the standard of God for going to heaven, for fellowship with God? It is righteousness. And if there's none righteous, no, not one, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then we are all under that condemnation that the wages of sin is death. So that is what the merit of our sin is. And because we're not righteous, we also cannot be the sacrifice for our own sins. So God provided a lamb, one without blemish, one without fault, without sin, who lived a sinless life, was tried in every point as we are, but without sin. And he hung him on that cross in your place and mine. And there he took our sins upon himself, and he died. Now, I pointed out in the email, there are religions such as Islam. I asked a, a, former, a former student to be an imam under Islam. He had come to Christ by reading the scriptures. And I was asking, there, there were two interviews going on that we were videoing at that point in time, and his was going to be later. So as I sat and talked to him through an interpreter, I asked him the question. I said, what, what do they believe about the New Testament, about Christ? He said, oh, they believe everything in the Bible about Christ. All the miracles, everything he did, and he's a good man, a good prophet. And, but he says, except one thing, the day of the crucifixion, they do not believe he went to the cross. Many deny the death of Christ. Some will say, well, he was just, he had fainted. Or he was in some deep sleep. He did not die. The penalty of sin is what? Death. Had Christ not died on that cross, he would not have paid the penalty for our sins. So do not negotiate with anyone who's trying to say, oh, well, that's just semantics. We can let no. If he didn't die, then our sin penalty is not paid. The second phrase is to support the first one, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Remember, God said he was going to die. If he had not died, that makes God a what? A liar. But how, what's the second phrase? And that he was buried. We don't bury live people. You only bury someone who has passed away. And they verified, and you'll recall the story in the Gospels, how when they came to those three crosses, the practice of the Roman soldiers was to break the legs of the convicted criminals. So that, you know, it's getting dark, getting to a certain point, so they would break the legs where they could no longer push themselves up to catch a breath. And they would suffocate in a matter of minutes. And then they would die, they would take them down and bury them. They broke the legs of the two thieves, but when they came to Christ, they saw that what? He was already dead. And they did not break a single bone of his body, which fulfilled the prophecy that not a single bone would be broken. You see how all the details are there. So he was dead and he was buried according to the scriptures. Now the second part of this, of the gospel, if he had died and been buried and that's where it, the story ends, then we are still lost in our sins. Because while he was a good man and he died to death and he had very good intentions, he did not conquer sin, death, and hell. But what happened? 
Well, look at the latter part of verse 4. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, there are several types and pictures in the Old Testament. We don't have time to go through them all that speak about the resurrection and things like that. But I was reading several commentaries, and, and the commentaries tried to explain away that phrase according to the scriptures. He says, I think he's talking about the whole of the scriptures because nowhere in the Old Testament did it say that he would rise on the third day. And you can search the Old Testament. You're not going to find that statement. Take your calendar for a moment. And this is where I would beg to differ with those, and they are more learned men than I, I assure you. But there's something you cannot ignore. As we're studying through the book of Leviticus, and we study those feasts, and the dates of those feasts. Now, I put at the top Exodus 12. Why is Exodus 12 relevant to this calendar? Well, if you go back and read Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2, God said, this is going to be the new beginning of the year for you, Israel. He resets their calendar. The first month of the year is going to be the month of Nisan. And you're going to start, and on the 10th day, you're going to take a lamb. And he went through all those preparations for the Passover. So what happens on day 14 of Nisan is the Passover. Day 15 of Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It begins on that Sabbath, and it goes through the following Sabbath. Then the Feast of First Fruits. This was the feast. It had to do with the harvest. The early crops that started bringing forth fruit, the earliest, they would start coming in right about that time. And they would bring the first fruits of the crop and place it before the Lord. And then, of course, 50 days later, after First Fruits, you have Pentecost. And that's, again, it has to do with the crops and everything there. But... For, from 1446 B.C. until about 30 A.D., it'll, it'll, some believe different years, but it's, a, it's around that year, 30 A.D. So you're talking almost 1,500 years. Israel observed the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. Now, we've been through that study. Last year, I spoke on God's redemption calendar. That was the theme of the message for Easter. And you can go back, it's still online. But the focus is this. For 1,500 years, they went through these feasts. And I believe that when time came, when God was going to fulfill in the fullness of time, Jesus came. And in the, in the right time, he went to the cross. Remember, time and time again, they were threatening to arrest Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Or what did the scripture say? My time has not yet come. The time has not yet come. And he had walked right through the crowd that wanted to arrest him, and they didn't even see him because it was not the time. But then you get to that point in John when it says the time has come. The time when he would have to go to that cross. But for 1,500 years, the nation of Israel, in anticipation of the coming of their Messiah, they celebrated. It's like a dress rehearsal because 1,500 years later, look below that line, the, resurrection, uh, the crucifixion occurred on what day? The day of the Passover. A perfect picture of the shedding of blood and the application of blood and the power of that blood. The animals, only to cover sin, the Messiah would take away their sins. And then, of course, the burial came on the day of unleavened bread. You see, the unleavened bread is when you remove all the leaven from the house, and leaven is a picture and type of sin, you have no basis for a sinless, sanctified life apart from the blood of Christ. Those who want to try to be good and clean up their life before they get saved, it's not going to work. Because the blood must be shed first and applied. Then we have the basis of living a, a life without sin. And then, of course, we have the first fruits. The first fruits, that was the picture of the crops, but... Here we have the first fruits, that day that was the resurrection of Christ. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says Christ is the first fruits here in chapter 15. If you look at the order of the resurrections, Christ the first fruits, verse 23, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Did it, was he raised again the third day according to the scriptures? 
I believe so, because I believe they had a prophetic calendar, and for 1,500 years almost, they had been practicing the very events of the Passover, the real Passover, not the one back in Exodus when they left Egypt, the one that that foreshadowed in the coming of Christ when he went to Calvary, he went to that tomb, and he rose again on the first day of the week. So did God prophesy that he would be raised the third day? Absolutely. There was nothing, there's, there's no question here. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Well, what support do you have for the fact that he rose again? Well, look at this. And that he was seen. And he gives a list of people, and we'll look at that in a moment. But the essence of the gospel is this. You can take out everything else, but the essence is this. Christ died, he was buried, that guarantees he was dead. He rose again, and he was seen of many, many witnesses. How do we know? Because of, and we'll go through the details of these different witnesses, and then later on, the very life of the apostles and the life and death situations they faced daily. It was an argument for the fact they had seen the risen Christ. You don't, you don't give your life for a lie, but they will give their life for the truth. Well... Folks, this is non-negotiable. We do not negotiate with the virgin birth of Christ. Now, I may not agree with certain points of certain different parts of the scriptures, and many don't. By the way, we're going to get to a verse in a few moments. There are over 30 different interpretations of that verse, most of which are viable, and no one can tell you for sure which interpretation is the exact one. Now, there are some things we can tell you for sure, but we'll get there in a moment. But one thing about this, you cannot interpret the scriptures that Christ did not die, that he was not buried. You cannot interpret it that he did not rise from the dead. Those are, it is, the importance to the gospel is absolutely fundamental. Without it, you lose your foundation, you lose the power. Well, now we're going to look at the recount of the witnesses here. How do you know that he rose again? Well, he was seen, the Bible says he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter. Remember Peter? What did Peter do? When he was arrested and he was tried, he tried to follow and kind of observe things from a distance. He had sworn that night before. He says, I will never leave you, Lord, though all forsake you, I will not forsake you. And as he's following along and observing the trials that go on through that night, someone says, aren't you one of them? Oh, no, I, I, I'm not one of them. Then somebody else, yes, I know, you, your speech betrays you. No, no, I don't know the man. The third time, the, the Bible says he swore, I do not know him. And fulfill what Christ had told him he would do. So imagine what happens when John 21 comes and he's been, he died, he was buried, and he's in the grave three days. And these disciples are kind of hiding, waiting what's going to happen. And so Peter, I can just imagine the anguish that he was going through. That he had so vehemently said, I will not deny you. And then he denies him three times, just like Jesus said. Well, you go to Acts chapter 2 and you see Peter standing up and standing before those that crucified the Lord of glory. And he preaches the gospel to them. What happened? How does a man who is afraid to admit he knows him, there in John chapter 20 and earlier, stand up and preach him in the face of a mob that would have killed him just days earlier? What happened? He saw the risen Savior. John chapter 21. They're out fishing. And Jesus, of course, you know the story. He says, throw the nets on the other side. And after not catching anything all night, they catch their nets full. And so Peter knows it's Jesus. He, he dives in the water and swims to shore. And I can't imagine how awkward that moment must have been, just the two of them. But Jesus has breakfast ready for them. And then he takes Peter off and he restores him to the ministry. And not only that, but he tells Peter, Peter, you're going to die a horrible martyr's death, verses 18 and 19, I believe it is. 
said, now come and follow me. And Peter followed him. Now, how does a man like Peter follow someone if indeed he did not see the risen Christ? He was afraid to acknowledge he knew him when he was going to the cross. But had he not met the risen Christ, he would not have in any way been willing to suffer for the gospel, let alone die for it. And then, of course, it goes on. It says, and of the twelve... He appeared to the twelve in that room. Remember, he came through the door when the door was closed. And some of them thought, you know, this is, this is a ghost. And Thomas, he was the doubting one, remember? He had to, he, I've, got to I've got to touch the, the wounds in his hands and feet before I'm going to believe it. Well, he appeared to them. And the Bible says he appeared to 500. Now, nowhere else in Scripture other than here is this recorded. Some believe this is the group at the Great Commission. I don't know. But 500 at the same time. Now, stop and think about this. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that all of you are here this morning. Do you doubt it? Do you doubt that I'm here this morning? Say, no, why? Because I see you. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you could produce 500 witnesses that all saw you at the same time? Let's say over the past year. Can any of us do that? No. Yet we don't question our existence, do we? We don't question someone, that someone is alive and that they are there. The Lord Jesus, the resurrected Christ, has more evidence of his resurrected body and his resurrected presence than you and I do that we're here right now. And we don't doubt our existence. So we have no need to doubt the resurrection of Christ. And Paul's saying, Sepha saw him, and you know the situation there. And the twelve saw him. They were afraid, and now they're standing up and they're serving and dying for the name of Jesus Christ. The 500, most of whom are still alive. Verse 7, he was seen of James. This also is not recorded in Scripture. And then of all the apostles. Each of the apostles has said that was one of the requirements to be an apostle was you had to be a witness of the resurrected Christ. And then he goes, says, and last of all, and this is last of all in the sense of chronology. He appeared to all these, and what he's trying to do again is create the sequence. From the time he was crucified, buried, he rose again. This is the order. He began to be seen by people. So we have evidence of his resurrection, eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Not just two or three, we have hundreds. And the last of those is me. And in that phrase there, he says, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. That phrase, it means, it, it refers to a stillborn baby. A baby that's born without life. He, he was born prematurely or out of, it, it, abnormally, in a wrong time. And that's how he referred to himself. Why? Because he did not walk with Christ those three and a half years. In fact, he persecuted Christ. He persecuted the apostles after Christ died. He was there at the death of Stephen in Acts. So he said, and he goes on to say, I am the least of the apostles, and I am not meet. I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. How in the world could God take me from being a persecutor and basically a murderer of Christians to placing me in the ministry and putting me in as an apostle of the very Lord that I persecuted. He said, I'm not worthy of it. But look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Some of you have questioned my apostleship in the, in the church at Corinth. But it's not by your making me or recognizing. It's not by my choice. But God, as Galatians, he said in Galatians, he separated me from birth. He called me from birth. To this task from before my birth. So by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which bestowed upon me was not in vain. I, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Talking about the other apostles. 
But look at this. It wasn't to brag. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now look at this picture. From verse, nine, from verse 8, as a stillborn baby. Now that, that refers to someone who's dead. And that was his condition. And then he says, I am not meet. I am not worthy to be called an apostle. And that was one who's, yes, he was not worthy of it. But yet God separated him anyway. And then it comes down to this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it shows the power of the grace of God in the life of a believer. And that is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You and I were dead in trespasses and sins. Unworthy to be called a child of God. And yet God saved us, didn't he? And we, we weren't worthy to be called the children of God. And yet he puts, puts us there by, by the grace of God. We are what we are are not by any merit or works of our own that is the power of the resurrection and his grace the question here that we could close this section with is how are we laboring in light of this what he has done for us and the grace that has been bestowed to us what impact has that had in our lives we're going to ask that question throughout this passage so he says in verse 11 therefore Going back, over to, back to the moreover in verse 1. Brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you. I gave you what I received in verse 3. So he says, therefore, whether it were I, Paul, or they, the other apostles, so we preach and so ye believed. We have preached and we are preaching the same gospel. It hasn't changed. It will not change. And that's what you believed, if indeed you did believe. So what's the importance of the resurrection? It is the foundation and the core of our faith. If you take it out, as we're going to see in the next part, what are the repercussions of no resurrection? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage, one that while many will question the historicity of the Bible, no one questions the historicity of 1 Corinthians 15. And here you have given us very detailed proof and, and the argument that is incontrovertible to the death, the burial, the resurrection, and then the eyewitnesses of the risen Christ. Lord, we thank you for that assurance and hope that we have in Christ. So many religions, they... They never can tell whether you for sure are born again, whether for sure you're on your way to heaven, whether for sure your sins have been forgiven you. And they live in fear, but in Christ and the salvation we have in him, we know our sins are forgiven. We know in whom we have believed, and Lord, because of that, we know that he is coming again for us. Apply your word to our hearts. And prepare our hearts for the next hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.